Did you ever stand at the bedside of somebody who was in their last days? And they had some things they wanted to tell you, some things to get off their chest, maybe some things they're sad about, and they told you about those. For me, it was my last time with my dad, who'd done some things to really ravage his physical body. But he wanted to talk, and he wanted to ask forgiveness and express some regrets. It still haunts me, that, that moment. I still remember that night that he, that he talked with me. Something very significant is wrapped up when we kind of are dealing with the last words of somebody. And that's what we have here for Jesus in this passage from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. It's some of the last words that Jesus has with his disciples before he's taken up into heaven. He tells them what they need to know and what they need to do with their lives and with their ministry. Listen to what Luke the doctor writes in Acts 1, verses 1 through 8. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What Jesus said to them those important words could be described in the four sentences that I wrote down for you on that insert. Let's look at them. Here's the first one. The church has always been a collection of ordinary people, people like you and like me. Someone wrote, and I saw this on a bumper sticker a while back, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats. <laughs> because if God is our co-pilot, we're in trouble. He's got to be the pilot. He's got to be the main one that's in charge of what's happening. God always uses ordinary people like you and me. Remember Arthur Blessett? I think it was Arthur who carried a cross around the world, had a big rubber tire on it. He took it to dozens and dozens of countries all over the world and spoke to people, had the opportunity to talk about his faith. His son was in the hospital, but they used to live in Cape Coral. In fall of 2005, his mom, Tina, writes, my nine-year-old son, Austin, had his tonsils removed. Before the surgery, the anesthesiologist came in to start the IV. He was wearing a cool surgical cap covered with colorful frogs. Austin really liked that hat, the frog hat. When the doctor started to leave, Austin called out, hey, wait, do you go to church? Well, no, the doctor admitted, but I probably should, but I don't. Austin then asked, well, are you saved? Laughing nervously, the doctor said, nope, but after talking to you, maybe it's something I should consider. Pleased with this response, Austin answered, well, you should, because Jesus is really great. I'm sure he is, little guy, the doctor said, quickly made his exit. When Austin's surgery was finished, the anesthesiologist came into the waiting room to talk to me. He told me that the surgery went well, and then he said, Mrs. Blessed, I don't usually come down and talk to parents after surgery, but I just had to tell you what your son did. Oh boy, she thought, I wonder what the rascal did now. The doctor explained that he'd just put a mask on Austin and ready to put him under when Austin signaled that he needed to say something. As soon as the mask was removed from Austin's mouth, he blurted it out. Wait a minute, we have to pray. The doctor told him to go ahead. And so Austin prayed this prayer. 
Dear Lord, please let the doctors and nurses have a good day. And Jesus, please let the doctor with the frog hat get saved and start going to church. Amen. <laughs> the doctor admitted that that had touched him. I was so sure that he'd pray for his own surgery, but instead he didn't do that. He, he prayed for me. I had to come down and let you know what a great little guy you have. A few minutes later, a nurse came to take me to the post-op room. She had a big smile on her face as she walked toward the elevator. There's something you need to know, she said. Some of us other nurses have been praying that that doctor for a long time would come to Christ. And after your son's surgery, he tracked a few of us down and said to us, well, girls, you got me. If that little boy could pray for me when he could have had his own surgery prayed for, then I think maybe I need his Jesus too. Ordinary people like you and me. Sentence number two goes this way. The church has given extraordinary power to change the world. Ordinary people, yes, but with extraordinary power. Look at verse five. Here's what Jesus said to them. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you a question a pastor by the name of Martin Lloyd-Jones asked at the time he was a pastor at Westminster Chapel in London. He was a great preacher in the Reformed theology. That's kind of our niche here. Near the end of his life, as some say at the pinnacle of his ministry, he asked his congregation a question one morning. He said, I want to talk to you today about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You may call it what you want, but I want to know, have you experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit? I know all of you listening to me come as I do from the Reformed background, but that's not enough. I know that all of you would want to say to my question about the Holy Spirit, we got it all at conversion. There's no other need for any more experience. Well, said Jones, I have only one other question to ask you. If you got it at conversion, where in God's name is it? Tough question. One night, my pastor, when I was in high school, I guess it was, yeah, early high school, explained it to me this way. He said, when you trust your life to Jesus for salvation, you have the Holy Spirit. But being baptized in or with the Holy Spirit, you not only have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has you. All my, Christ all my life, I've been a Christian. Confirmed, baptized, president of my youth group, sat on the official board, sang in the choir. Reminded me of one night when I came to grips with a tough decision I had to make, and I didn't have what it took to make the decision. The decision was about going to seminary and leaving everything that was familiar to me behind. It was the night that I surrendered my life to Jesus, and I asked him to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. That's what Luke's word says in verse 5. Someone wrote, the task ahead is never so great as the power behind us. Ordinary people with extraordinary power. Third sentence goes this way. The church is to be a witness to the nations. Look at Habakkuk 2, 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Psalm 96, verse 5. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. Someone writes about taking a road trip, stopping at McDonald's for lunch. After placing the order, the person says, I came up to the drive through window to pay. I noticed an attractive hand-carved cross hanging from a woman's neck, and so I commented, hey, I really like your cross. Her reply was a lesson to me in how simple it is to share one's own testimony. She said, thank you. I like the person who died on it for my sins. 
And I love the person who rose from the grave after hanging on the cross. She could have just said, well, thank you. I'm glad you like it. But her faithful witness touched me, he writes, and drew me even closer to the Lord that day. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God members of every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. People of the Hamara tribe in northeastern India were once fierce headhunters. They were infamous for their vicious slayings of people. In 1910, a Welsh missionary, Watkin Roberts, sent the Gospel of John to the Hamar chief. And as a result, the chief asked Roberts to come and explain the scriptures to him. In less than two generations, the entire Hamar tribe had come to Christ. Soon after, the British government expelled Roberts from India, but his efforts continued to produce fruit. He outlived his life. A very small tr a tribe headed by now Rochunga and Maui Pudate said they really wanted to make a difference. The tribe has grown to over a million people. God gave the couple a dream to give a free copy of the New Testament to all the families on the face of the earth. They founded a ministry called Bibles for the World and they have since sent 16 million copies of the New Testament translated in the appropriate local language to the homes that would receive it. 16 million. The fourth sentence goes this way. The church is strategically positioned to be sent. Matthew 9, verse 37. You know this one. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are are few. The result of, this, of a survey points this out. The number of unchurched people who are receptive to attending church if invited by a friend, 82% would come if invited. The number of church-going Christians who've invited somebody to church, 21%. So often we find ourselves, and tell me if I'm wrong, but we find ourselves in a holy huddle. I've had people say to me, Pastor, every person that I socialize with, all my friends are already Christians. They're church churchgoers. We pray a little prayer at the end of every message, generally, to invite people to receive Christ. And we've had folks say, well, what do you do that for? Isn't everybody here a Christian already? But yet, we know there are some of us that God's got us here at this particular time in this particular place for a purpose rather than just in the holy huddle. The percentage of Americans who've never known a Buddhist, 59%. The percentage of Americans who have never known an undocumented immigrant, 54%. The percentage of Americans who have never known a Muslim, 46%. Percentage of Americans who have never known a homeless person, 45%. If we're in our holy huddle, we need to find some other friends and other relationships and allow God to put us in touch with some other people where we can find an opportunity to do what God's called us to do. And you shall be my, what? Witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem. That's right here in our town. And Judea, that's like in the counties around us. And Samaria, that's people who live right here where we do, except they're from a different cultural place in their life and then to the ends of the earth. This is not an either or thing, it's a, it's a both and thing. We are called to a global mission, digging water wells in Mozambique, joining Scott and Gigi Martel in Ethiopia in the village of Hope Orphanage. That's a global mission. There are many other opportunities you're gonna be seeing. We're called to a local mission, feed local school children, Love Inc, crisis assistance ministry, our Christian Food Pantry, Little Blessings Child Care, Lagos Children's Ministry, Financial Peace University with Dave Ramsey, the list goes on and on. Question you might be asking yourself is, how can I participate? 
How can I serve? One way is by giving. You notice there's an insert in there that tells you about feeding the school children. $25 provides weekend food and meals for a child for a month. And we need to stuff 50 bags. That's been our commitment. By giving and then by serving. One of the serving opportunities in there is to volunteer to work at the concession stands at the Bay Hill Golf Tournament, which brings a lot of resources in to support ministries that are ours. Local and global have been put together to create a new word. It's called glocal, and that's the ministry that we're called to do. To wrap up, a couple years ago, I was out at Willow Creek Church in Illinois. A guy by the name of Kirby John Caldwell was there. He's a black pastor from inner city of Houston, Texas. He's done some amazing things. But he said something one day that really caught my attention. Here's what he said. There are two great moments in a person's life, two. The moment you were born and the moment you realized why you were born. When you know why you're born, you'll do everything you can to outlive your life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for calling each of us to serve you, to be your witnesses in all those places. Fill us with your spirit. Use us to fulfill the calling you've placed on each of our lives. And God, I pray for anybody in this room today who wants to make the next step with you, to get on board with your purpose to be filled with your power. I invite you to pray a simple prayer like this from just from your heart to God's. God, I need you in my life. I need to have my past forgiven and forgotten. I need to have a reason for living my life. And, and God, I receive your offer of a home in heaven when I die. Thank you for all that you've done for me. I open my heart, my life, my future to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.